Hello everyone, welcome to the Thai Global Education Session. And uh, we have with us uh, a great guest, uh, Geeta Dharmaraj, uh, who's shaking up the education system in India. And uh, we have Tariq Khan and Satish Cha, uh, who are our co-chairs for the Thai Education SIG, who will be leading the session. Over to you, Tariq. Thank you, uh, Mohini. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have uh, a Thai Global working as a team and getting uh, these events organized. It's morning here on the West Coast and uh, good evening to all our attendees in India and I guess Satish, your East Coast. So good morning to you. Good morning. Welcome, Gita. We are honored to have you here. And uh, as we get into the event, uh, I will give a suitable introduction to what we're doing. Um, my uh, dear friend uh, Sriram has also joined and he reminded me that uh, uh, it's always worth doing a quick uh, summary of what we are doing in the education group. And uh, I have just one slide I want to show, which is this one. And please, everybody, uh, Mohini, can you see this one slide? Yes. Yeah. So uh, in the education SIG, uh, what we did was it's a very big canvas. So we have uh, split it into three perspectives, the K-12, higher education, and uh, lifelong learning. And we also have uh, it uh, in another dimension, the perspective of the entrepreneur and the investor and the educators. So over the last uh, six, eight months, we've had the benefit. We're seeing uh, another photograph, not the presentation. Okay, now you see it, okay. So over the last six, eight months, uh, we have had the benefit of so many speakers and guests, and we're trying to cover the entire canvas. So a lot of educators have joined us, uh, professors and policymakers. Uh, we've had investors and also entrepreneurs. And uh, as we go into the next year, we will, uh, of course, be um, strengthening even more what we are doing and so forth. So we've had uh, excellent attendance, great engagement, and I cannot but very thankful to uh, how uh, the thing has worked out. So uh, now I want to stop sharing the screen and go back to today's session. And uh, uh, Mohini, what can you see? No screen, right? Yeah, I don't see it. Okay, good, <laughs> thank you. So um, today's session, uh, we have uh, uh, Gita Dharmaraj, who has joined us. Now, Gita comes to us with uh, a phenomenal background. It's phenomenal for many reasons, and uh, some of you may have um, seen her profile, but uh, Satish uh, introduced me to her a week or so back, and I engaged. It's a nice conversation. And uh, a lot of people you know, engage in education, but what I found unique is, uh, firstly, uh, the target population. You know, not everyone, in fact, very few people venture into the, you know, slum dwellings and people who are in abject poverty with a sustained program and a mission to help them get out of poverty on education. So that's one thing for many years, like 30, 40 years, if not more. Her approach is unconventional. So very early on, Gita realized the importance of stories and how they can be used to help engage children. Unless children are engaged and taken through an experiential journey, it's much harder for them to learn. And this realization made her invent and come up with a design for a books in, in a certain way. And she formed uh, the Kata School and uh, launched it. And the approach has worked. It has led to the education of thousands of uh, children and resulted in hundreds of schools being set up in partnership now with government and uh, municipalities. Gita is now recognized for this disruption. She is uh, a story-based learning works and she is uh, called all over the world to share her experience. Now, underlying this, and you might say, how does this connect with entrepreneurship is a spirit of entrepreneurship she has and she tries to make sure that all the children and 
uh, students she's working with, they are empowered to bring that. So we will hear about how that works as well. But welcome, Gita, and we are honored to have you here today with us. Thank you so much, Tariki, and Satish Ji, and Mohini. Thank you so much, and all our friends out there. Welcome, Gita. Yes. So, <clears throat> just to get started, and you know, I may have uh, summarized the background a little bit uh, incorrectly or imbalanced, and if that happens, Gita, I'm sure you will correct me. But uh, just to uh, get started, um, Simple question, you were in the USA in the early 80s and you went back to India. What was the driver for that? Well, India, I think, more than anything else. I uh, went to the US because my husband was studying at the University of Pennsylvania. We didn't have any money, so I had to take up a job. I was given a job of a typist, which I could not do. I'm not a typist. I'm a writer, but it took a long time to convince uh, the Americans that, you know, an Indian could write in English. And, uh, and then uh, my writing was seen by uh, the editor of the Pennsylvania Gazette, which was started by Benjamin Franklin, and which is an award-winning Ivy League magazine. And so I started working over there. I wrote a lot of things over there. I saw a lot of things. I learned a lot of things because I started studying at the University of Pennsylvania, auditing courses. I didn't have the time to do a full-time course. And every day, the need to go back to India and to touch base was getting bigger and bigger. And every time I crossed that bridge to go over, I would smell, actually smell uh, turmeric. And I, that, that was time that I was to go home. And uh, so I came home, yes. Okay. So, uh, of course, you uh, had uh, a lot of learning, a lot of exposure, and you learned a whole new world while you were there, and you brought that back home. Yes, a lot of things, because I was on the Ivy League Publishing Committee, which means all these universities which formed the Ivy League uh, were part of it. And I was on the consultation team. Uh, UPenn had me on all their committees because you see, I wear a nose ring and I wear a sari, and they thought that it was very good for uh, whatever they, uh, you know, it was a diversity that I was representing over there. So my co-editor always used to laugh at me and say, Geeta, they are not calling you for yourself, they are calling you because you wear a nose ring. So it's quite possible it was because of that. But I was on a lot of committees. I was invited by right from Dartmouth to um, Johns Hopkins to Harvard to sort of come in and do things with them. I was able to study a little bit, uh, actually do a course in Harvard, uh, which taught me a lot of things that I didn't know, like the balance scorecard, which I never knew about. And so there was a lot of learning that happened for me, which all came together. But one of the main things was the Van Pelt Library and the kind of books that the Van Pelt had I mean, it was amazing. I was a faculty and I could borrow any number of books and I used to borrow a whole library of books and bring them home and nobody said no to it at all. So it was this thing, this greed for books, the greed for reading and, and then knowing that India could translate much more. We need to know ourselves as a people. We need to know who we are from the literatures that we are reading. So it was a journey that started uh, looking at India from outside. And then you come back again and look at your backyard and you say, my God, the backyard is so rich and I want to be there. Very interesting. So a lot of people and organizations, they work with and help uh, the underserved in many ways. So how did your uh, approach, different approach come about or get invented? Well, basically, again, it would be children, because when I went to Delhi, I was, uh, I, I come from South India myself, and uh, in the South, I led a very, uh, I was very naive, I must say, I was very, very naive in 1987, when I went to Delhi, and I went into a government school, 
and I knew very little Hindi because I grew up during the Hindi anti-agitation uh, days. So, uh, so I was there right in front shouting that, you know, don't trust Hindi down our throats. And here I was reading Hindi with the children. So I'm struggling and the children are struggling. And I'm wondering, what am I doing over here? And what happened really was that, you know, I started learning and I would ask the children, Iska matlab kya hai? what is the meaning of this that you've read? And they'll say, what nonsense? I just read out the whole sentence to you and you want me to tell the meaning for it? I am not ready for it. So going from, you know, how to read and then how to make meaning of what you're reading, the whole purpose of reading. So taking children from an oral tradition uh, into a written tradition with great felicity and ease and grace, I think, with keeping the children in front and using the Shravana Shakti that we call uh, the, the ability to listen and to make sense of what I listen and to learn from what I listen, which is a very, very uh, topmost skill that you know oral tradition gives. This is what we started with. Yes, did yeah. I answer your question, Tariq? Well, well it does. I mean, uh, you saw that uh, there was an absence of uh, engagement, like the child was uh, reading a passage, but not really understanding or engaging the passage. Yes. Because they could not, they could not understand the meaning. You see, they would leave out the matra on top. So Nila would become Nala. Now, when Nila becomes Nala, they are not able to understand what that sentence is because you need the Iki matra over there to make sense of that word. So basically what was happening is the learning to read had become so rote that when they when they when something was put up on a blackboard, the child's finger would be, you know, right on the top and she'll be reading right at the bottom because she's reading by rote, but her hand hasn't kept pace with what she's learned by heart. So this is the situation we have even today in many of the schools. There is a rote learning that happens, which makes children not learn for meaning and not learn for fun. So if learning is not fun and learning is not for meaning, then there is no incentive, there is no joy, and therefore there's no engagement. So engagement comes from that. So is that why you came up with a magazine and then they started following the stories? Yes, I thought that I'll do a magazine because I thought children could read and uh, started off with a magazine. Took the magazine into the slums of Delhi and I was pretty shocked as I told you. I said, no, 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 this is not the start. I'm putting the cart before the horse. I first need to teach children how to read before I can give them books that they can read. But then the National Sample Survey of 1987-88 had said that children did not found school boring and they found textbooks dull. So in 1990, when I started the school with five children in a large slum cluster in Delhi, I said, no textbooks. Our teachers were all from the community. They were all very, very poor themselves. They understood the child. And I said, the heart is more important than the mind. I can train the mind, but I cannot train the heart. And that is how the whole learning started for us with a de-school. Ivan Illich, of course, de-schooling society. So I thought we were all de-schooling society together. So the other day you showed me just one or two pages of your books. Do you want to share just one or two pages with the audience here? Oh, sure, I would. This is one of the books that we have done uh, last year. And this is called Paid. And this is the first page. If I bring it close, you can see the one word at the bottom, which is paid. Tree, that is tree. Now what we've done is we've had the tree in very different art forms from our regional artists. They are all storytellers. They tell the story from different, different. This is a Madhubani style. By now we are saying the tree has been cut and you have the astonishment in the face of the fish over here. You see that the tree is sort of fallen. You see the little sun up there and you are saying what has happened to the tree? Cut gaya. The tree has been cut. And then you go to various, this comes from South India. It's a very, very uh, tribal style of illustration from South India. So we were trying to be as inclusive as possible with art, 
and bringing art education to the child along with the story saying that the fruits are there the tree is got birds it's got life and still this tree with all its life has been cut has been cut so um i i get it so tell me oh we spoke about the chipko and we we have we have activities at the back for the child to say how can you prevent this what can you do to stop this from happening so the whole idea was to introduce children not just to the big idea of trees and how important they are in a very very childish language without anything and introducing art to them and introducing literature because mind you this story this little poem was written by clara benigni uh who wrote in germany in german and it was hers so we brought in german culture and we said what do the germans do what does the world do and what does india do and how do we manage how do we learn from the world so there was a lot of learning happening from just this one book with only about 25 words in it 25 words in it so i get it i mean without a doubt you get them to be interested you get them to engage you relate them to what are the actions you can take all of that i get that but then to get a decent level of um, if you like vocabulary how many books did you have to produce like this oh we have done more than 400 500 books till now and uh, we we have a very different uh, scale uh, tarik ji our first is social change our second is the our green policy that we have to plant trees for all the trees we cut to make our books and the third is the financial so we are always poor we don't have a very financial <laughs> balance in qatar i'm sorry but uh, we manage we manage to do these really lovely books over here so disrupting disrupting and establishing an innovative approach always meets resistance to describe some of the objections and challenges you came across well the first challenge that i met was when i went into the homes of the children the mother said ha bachche to school jana hai children have to go to school but they have to support me and most of our homes the the huge slum cluster which had about a lakh in 150000 people in it when definitely 50% hindu and 50% muslim with us with us few other communities and uh, uh, constituencies in it but 50% muslim 50% hindu the muslim women were not allowed out of the house the women were 50% of the women living over there were heading their households the men were there they could show their uh, you know they could show their uh, the men who came after them they could show that you know there is a man on the charpai over there and he guards me and you will not come into the house but the man on the charpai had been working day and night and he was many times he was under the influence of alcohol the women were child making machines as you know so i thought if women could earn then children could learn so how do we get women to earn so children could learn so the whole idea was to start off so as soon as i started the school with just five children uh very soon after that two three months after that started the income generation program for the women and that is how we bought the buy in from the women in the community not from the men we had to invite the men later on on holy to bring them in and they came in and the women all danced with their parda out and with their backs to the audience because they didn't want to see the men and dance for them but later on we reached a point when the men were saying jao go and work in kata go and learn in kata so many of our women came in and they graduated from the 10th and graduated from the 12th but that's another story i felt a lot of opposition from uh, people who knew me and they said you are just a writer i mean how do you want to go in and do something like this you are not fit for it so uh, why don't you leave these things to other people and but i said i i can't because i want to do this and they said my ideas were very elitist 
and uh, would not fit in with the idea. I remember going to one of the states, a North Indian state, and they told me, do rupiya ke liye kuch de do inko. There, there is no need for you to spend more than two rupees on any child. I said, this is six rupees. Our magazine then was six rupees. I said, can you spend six rupees and we can give them color? Because Tariq ji, your child and my child can read any scrap of paper. But if you're not used to reading, you need something which is exciting. You need right. color. And that is what we wanted. But I couldn't get the six rupees. So I had to manage the two rupees. And then, you know, we would have a blackboard in my office and we'd write down how many people were giving us money. It was children from different parts of the country saying, do rupiah hai mere paas. Can I get a tamasha copy? And we'd put two and one of us in the team will say, okay, I'm putting in four rupees for that. So that is how we grew it. It was passion mainly more than anything else. I think I was lucky always moving from the I, which I never use now. There is a we, the hum of hum. And we are 150 of us and we are very passionate. We are very, very passionate driven people. So, you know, passion and belief is vital. Without that, you would not have, of course, been doing this. But along the way, what were the observations or some of the measures you used to see that the children were responding and they were learning? Just give us some sense of how you were feeling that, you know, it takes months and years. So give us some idea there. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, when we started, I said, let's have us, let's take in all children who are coming in. So it took us two years actually to get about 350 children coming to the school. But uh, after the 350 children had come in, we found there was a first obstacle. We didn't know at which grade the child was able to read and at which grade the child was in the government school they were going to. Because many of the children were at that time going to a government school, uh, some of them. So we said, okay, we will see, because we were working with children who are not going to school. We were look, working with out of school children. But when we got children from a government school coming in and saying, or mother chahiye, and we want to work with you, we want to get more help from you, we found that we had to have a kind of a measure. That is when we started measuring. But measurement actually started with one of our American donor partners who came in and they said, Geeta, not measuring is not good. I said, I just want the children to have fun. I think they will learn and I don't want to measure. So we had this huge discussion and dialogue and we used to quarrel over this matter. And then I realized myself, when the teachers came and said, Didi, bachchon ke liye ruchi nahi hai. I said, ruchi kahan se aata hai? Where do you get your flavor from for learning? So we started having this discussion on what is the flavor. And then we got these two, I would say, uh, continuous assessment, tools for us in around 1998-99. It was, one was called PAR. It was performance, attendance, and retention. And we said that PAR would bring all children, us PAR, cross the shore and go to the other shore, us PAR, and to be on PAR with the world. So we used the word in two senses to say that, you know, we bring children on par with the rest of the world and we help them to reach the other side. But Ruchi was a different thing. We had found by 1993-94 that reading was at the basis of every single thing that the child was doing. For instance, in class one, the child could read two plus two is four. When she came to class two, she was given there are two girls and two boys in this classroom. How many children are in the class? Gone, the child has failed. She's got a big red mark on her thing. Why? She could do the maths. She was in a maths class. Why was she not able to do the maths? Because she was not able to read the story sum. So the whole idea started there that we should start off with the story sum. So in 2001, and I must tell you, uh, Tariq Ji, that when we started, the average family income in our community, according to the Delhi government, was 600 to 800 rupees a month per family. With all the children working, one of our children, Mitrapal, would go at 4 o'clock in the morning and come back to school and he would be sleepy in school. In 2001, we took the challenge. 
no Kata child will live in poverty. In 2008, with the power and with the ruchi and everything, all our you know, measurement sticks and everything coming in, we looked at it and we found that our women were earning about eight times what the family was earning. And the children were earning about 20 to 30 times what the family was earning. Today, our women are earning 30 times what the family was earning and our children, 100, 100 times what the family was earning before. They've entered into the uh, administrative service, they are in um, Citibank, they are in uh, IBM. That day this boy comes in all suited and coated and the little ones are all looking at him. And then he says, Pata hai aapko mein, kahan mein kaam kar raha And they all say, and he says, I work in IBM. And nobody knows IBM, but they know that they would like to be like him, suited and coated and booted and doing well in life. So I think that the measurement thing was not in front of everything. It was at the back to help our teachers to measure and to learn rather than to tell the parent that your child is not reading well. We never shared it with the parents. Gita, when I came to your school in 2008, yes. something very interesting happened. I brought one laptop for a child and threw it about a dozen students who were about eight, nine, ten years old age. And you know, when PC laptop was designed, the children could open it very easily and adults could not. So I threw a challenge. I said, if you do it in two minutes, it would be a great story. And you know what they did? They all looked at each other. One child looked at one part, another in a different part, and by the time the fourth child had opened the laptop. So of course, that was a learning I saw, and I told Raju that day, I saw a dozen kids, and I saw 10 entrepreneurs and two chief secretaries of tomorrow. <laughs> the fact is that group was more innovative than I had seen at modern school at the same age. They could think differently. They could, in fact, I saw a, a child, eight year old, produced a newspaper in Qatar. That was edited better than I could remember my junior sub editors in Dansatta Rohingya. So that, that told me the kind of learning they went through in those four, five, six years at Qatar was extraordinary and way beyond any education system that I imagine could help them understand. And that was the key to it. But you know, you, you have scaled up quite a bit in some ways. But the point is, unless you turn that into a process, the world will not understand. So there are two different things. You were talking about bringing the passion that you brought in on the one hand, and the scaling up happens only when the process is there. How do you bridge that gap? Okay, that's a very interesting question. You see, in India, we believe, uh, we've always believed as uh, teachers and as educators that you have what are the lower order skills and the higher order skills. So you say the lower order skills are being able to read and write and things. The higher order skills are creativity, critical thinking. Now, a child when she's born is curious. She's a critical thinker. She's learning how to talk. She's learning how to stand. I remember seeing my daughter stand and I'm talking on the phone with my mother. And I said, my daughter is standing. And how did she stand? I didn't teach her to stand. She stood. She was learning. There was a critical thinking on her part and she was learning. Children are good. They are curious. It's when they come to school that we say, no, this is not the level you should be at. You shouldn't be curious. You shouldn't be a critical thinker. I don't want creativity from you. I remember going into one of the schools and one of the children had drawn a wave like this. And the teacher said, no, the wave comes like this. And the child was trying to say, no, I've seen the wave coming like this. The teacher said, no, you don't know. So draw the wave like this. And the child went back and drew the wave like this. Now, what does it matter? Maybe he did or she did see the wave coming this way. So this whole thing of letting the child be, which is what we managed to do in Qatar, because we don't have textbooks and the curriculum is a curriculum for life. It's an earth curriculum for life. So it is not there to pass a test or to pass an exam, but it is to be a ancha insan banne ka tarika kya hai. How do we make this good human being? Who can contribute to the world? We call it a me, we ideology. I'm important, my learning is important, but I have to take my society with me. How do I do that? How do I take everyone with me in this journey upwards? So this whole thing of taking people with me up when I go up and not feeling 
either endangered or you know uh, feeling diffident that you know maybe they will come and take my place if I teach them something or I do something. That thing was not there in our children. We did not allow competition to come in at all. And I think that is how we bridged both these things. You think I answered your question? We talk okay. later. Tariq, you want to say something? Uh, no, uh, these are very pertinent points. I mean, uh, how do you move from, you, know, you mentioned lower order and higher order skills. And what you're saying is some of those higher order skills are inside the child anyway. You just have to pull yeah, them out okay. somehow, right? Yes. 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 So, called the me skills, the me plus skills, and the we skills. These are the nine leadership skills that we teach our children right from the beginning, right from when they are in preschool and in primary school. They are the me skills, the me plus skills, and the we skills. And, and just on that, um, looking at uh, the evolution, because I do want to move on to NEP and its impact, but uh, give us a, just a snapshot of, uh, like, you know, you don't have, you're not a for-profit, you don't have a business model, so you're working on, uh, you know, donations, corporations, and governments help to describe to us how that works and the scale of where you are at now with the school. Okay, so when we started, as I said, we started with making books for children because uh, we think books are very, very important. We have to bring children from an oral tradition into a uh, written tradition. And that has to be done with great felicity and ease and grace, as I said earlier. So the Shravana Shakti, the ability to listen and the ability to see and learn from that was more important being able to read and understand and learn. So that, for that, we needed these very colorful books. So the first thing that Kata did was to write books and write books that would come from the child. When in 1990, I started with five children over there. I'm sorry, I use a die because at that time it was an eye. Uh, we started with five children. The idea was to bring the children together into a circle and we'll all be sitting together and we'll start off some story, Ek Rajata, and then somebody will say Ek Raniti, and then the story will go on. And then we replayed the uh, recording because we had bought a 350 rupee wala recorder. And the children were so excited. Oh, mera awaz hai, oh, mera awaz hai. They could recognize their voice. And that thing of listening to my voice was so very important. It didn't take money for us to make things happen. It needed heart to make things happen. By 1995, when I started the Kata School of Entrepreneurship, I started it because till then we thought we were a feeder school to government. And in 1995, one of our children, Renu, jumped off a tall wall because in school she was not getting the response, responses she wanted. She came to us when she was in class five, Tarikji. And she said, I want to be one class higher than my brother because he's one year younger than me. We tried very hard, but she managed to get into class six. And she didn't manage to last there for even six months. She came back because her elder brother was managing the family. And he said, why don't you go to work? And in school, she was being told that she was a bevakoop and she couldn't read. The only thing that this child could think of was climb up the wall and jump off. Luckily, she didn't get hurt. It was a thing. But we in Qatar, we started the Qatar School of Entrepreneurship. I said, that's the only thing we can do. We are not we are as responsible for children as the government is. Government is not the only responsible, doesn't have the only responsibility for children. Ye hamara bachche hai. So, ye hamara zimadari hai, hamara haq hai bhi. So, if you have the right and the responsibility, then you start. And that's how the Qatar School of Entrepreneurship, I started it in 1995. So, you will find that, you know, many times there are a lot of my God, I keep telling some story and I forget the question. Please, Tariq Ji, I'm so sorry. I'm very, very sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's uh, uh, Satish, you want to add something here? Yes, of course. Sir. Gita, I think you have won a school, which I remember for two very distinct things outside of all the good things you have done. You combine entrepreneurship and learning. You distinguish from education to learning. And in that sense, education was what the teacher was broadcasting. 
a subject, a knowledge given to children. Learning was what children were learning, what they were getting out of it. The focus from one to the other that changed everything from my point of view. That's what happened with us. That's one. Second, you combine entrepreneurship and learning at the same time. That was a much higher order class. How did you achieve that? Okay. Because I've always believed, Sadeji, that education is made up of two parts. There is a schooling part and there's a learning part. Many times we start with stop with the schooling and we don't get into the learning. Now, when you talk about being entrepreneurial or entrepreneurship, it is a learning part. Schooling can only give you this much. I can read all the books that are there behind uh, uh, Tariq Ji and all the books that are behind me and I will not be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is when I am able to practice. So this goes back to Gandhi Ji when he said, learn, learning by doing. And that is how we started with our children. So there was a pre-entrepreneurship uh, component of it where, you know, when children were in preschool, they would start with a Ganit Kendra. It was a maths lab. This was started in 92. Uh, and we would have children, these little children, saying that, okay, I have, uh, I have this thing. I have this elephant over here. So I am selling this elephant to you for five rupees. I'm selling this little thing for your mother's hair for two rupees. And they would, they would help the children to learn to sell and learn to buy. They were anyway doing it in their community. Entrepreneurship, again, I would say, is something the children learn. The mother gives them five paisa and says, go buy curry patta for me. The child goes and buys the curry patta. She remembers to get back the three paisa. She doesn't leave the three paisa with the, with the uh, salespeople, okay, with the, with the seller. So that, I think, you know, there is a natural connection between these two things. And all we did was to highlight it. All we did was to help the child to sort of think in those terms so that when they came into middle school and class five academy, they were really thinking entrepreneurially. They were not entrepreneurs yet, but they were thinking entrepreneurially. I want to take your message to the NEP now. You know, I had I had constant battle with the government for 30 years. I said our education policy was designed to produce employees. How about creating a policy which is designed to make people capable so they can become entrepreneurs in every sphere of work? Right? Now, does current NEP, in your opinion, address that question? Well, uh, to be very frank, it doesn't address the question directly. They still talk of vocational. They haven't used the word entrepreneurship at all, at all, through the whole document. And uh, I have read the document through and through. I showed it to uh, Tariq Ji yesterday. I have it here. This is the way I read my document. Every little thing underlined and every little thing commented on. And there's not a single way in which they are mentioning entrepreneurship. Now, vocational skills is not entrepreneurship. I can give a vocational and it comes into the charity mode for me because huh, give them some teaching them entrepreneurship is like teaching them how to fish. And giving them vocational skills is like giving them going almost up to them and saying, yeah, 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 I have a, I'll teach you fishing and then saying last minute, well, I don't have the time. I don't think I can teach you fishing. Here is the fish, take the fish. So I think, you know, what we have to really do is to say that we are, we are not shy of using the word entrepreneurship for all our children and that children can learn entrepreneurship at a very, very early age. Uh, yes. How do we take this message to the government and the leaders? And you were the one person. I mean, you know, Sheila Dixit was so fond of what you're doing. I am not coming here. I'm working in the grassroots of the children. Okay, so second question. You were another one school which has seen the experiments of uh, desktop, the Intel kind of laptop, and the one laptop per child. I don't know if you have time to look at the lessons from these three. If you remember, would you like to share them? Yes. I think, let me quickly say that, you know, when we started in 1990, we started the school, we were managing with print books because we had a lot of print books. We had a library in every classroom. Then by 2001, uh, we got, uh, you know, uh, BT 
1995, we got. I started the Qatar School of Entrepreneurship, and I got one donation from somebody from of a computer. By 2001, we had 13 computers, of which seven were not working. And then I said, no, we need an IT school which is as good as I am, Ahmedabad for our children. So started the Qatar Information and Ecom School. It was called Kites. And that model and that proposal that I had written somehow reached through friends or whatever reached uh, British Telecom. And British Telecom came forward. They said we are looking at a place in South Asia to start a center. We want to hear your story. They heard the story and they came in with Qatar. At the same time, Intel came in and Intel said we would like to work with you. I said we have enough money. We have BT with us, so we are going to be doing that. They said no, we would like to come. So they helped us to build a building. So we went from uh, from having 500 square feet of space through time to about 45,000 square feet of space with a playground at the back. So that is the growth as far as infrastructure goes for Qatar. The computers went from this to now we have I think more than 100 computers in our school in the Qatar Lab School. And when you look at the extension that happened from here. 2001, we start these things. 2007, eight, you bring in the OLPC. 2004, we've already started to be working with the communities, with other slum communities and poorer communities. 2009, the government invites us to come and work with them, and we start working with Chila Chila Dikshit Ji's government over there. Then by 2011, we decide that we don't want to be working at two ends of the government, which was one was a corporation. School and one was the government school, so the directorate run schools, which were a little better equipped than the corporation schools. So we went into the corporation schools and we took computers over there, and we they had computers and it was all locked up. So we managed to get them to open up the computers and allowed the teachers at least to work on the computers. Then we started a website for our teachers because I found that the teachers were not able to read and continuous things. So we started Pado Piarse. And then we went out and trained all our municipal corporation teachers to use their computers, and we taught them four things: how to upload, download, read, and write on the computer, and on their phone, on their mobile phone. We told them how your mobile phone can be a very powerful tool in your hands. And after that happened, and the Pado Piar say happened, government came back to us and they said, "Can we give you our schools and can you run our schools?" So they gave us three schools. Then they gave us two more schools, and now we have three schools. They've taken back a few schools because they are doing very well. They are first in their district, and they are first in science. So they've taken them back, and they give us the schools which are not doing badly. And we love working with children, so we bend over backwards. So that is the journey. And you know what is connecting it? Every one of the schools we own, we are running now, has a robotics lab. Has a robotics lab and. These are the first corporation schools which have robotic labs, and the the enrollment from five children has gone up to two hundred and fifty children. The newspapers noticed that they came and said two hundred percent increase in enrollment in government schools. It's possible. But Geeta, you are doing that a hundred rupees a child. How do you do that a hundred rupees? Well, it doesn't cost education a hundred rupees. It actually costs us thousand rupees per month per child, and we have partners. Yeah, that's realistic. Yes, and we don't even get hundred rupees from every child because we say that if you are coming regularly to school, it's twenty rupees off your next month's uh, tuition fee. If you are working with other children and you don't ask bully children and things like that, twenty rupees off. If your teacher sees that you're making an advancement and you're learning and you're you're moving forward in your academic career, twenty rupees off. If you're a girl child, it's twenty rupees off. And if your father comes once to the school, ten rupees off. If your mother comes once to the school, it's ten rupees off. Most children today are paying ten rupees. They are very regular. They are very helpful. They are learning at their best. And their mother comes to school, but the father never comes. So. A few years ago, we started the shopkeepers guild. That's an old idea in Delhi, the shopkeepers guild. We started the shopkeepers guild, and we called Raju Bhaiya, who was running a tea shop just outside our school. He said, "Raju Bhaiya, would you like to come in and learn a little bit about how to make more money?" He said, "Make money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come. I'll come." 
So he came in and we used the computers that we had at the, and our children were in the Qatar School of Entrepreneurship, looked at the money that he spent to buy his things and the money that he got and then how to keep a little aside as profit. They taught him how to do the account. Today, the shopkeepers guild is a separate unity on its unit on its own. They have their own secretary and they're running it on their own. So you see holistic education, integrated education, education which has a child at the center of it is not difficult. NEP 2020, I would say, takes energy, takes creativity, takes your heart. You have to break your heart if every child has to get it. But if government is willing to do it, NEP is a possible. Otherwise, NEP will be like every other policy that we've had in our country. It will be on paper, it will die on paper. That's true. But listen, we share a vision of taking this learning. I have no interest in taking education to 300 million, but learning to 300 million, that's what make, will make the difference. We share that vision. But you are the person who makes it happen. How do you plan to take it to 300 million now, in the next 10 years? Tell me. Okay. So, uh, so we've come very quickly to the 300 million. And uh, we have 300 million children in our country who are in school. The COVID has made a difference. I'm not talking about the COVID. Pre-COVID, we had 300 million children in school. Out of that, according to all statements, 150% 50 of them could read, 50% could not read. In 2016, UNICEF came up with a statement saying that we had missed our deadline and we will not be able to get primary, universal primary education for our children for the next 50 years, Pachasal. Now I said, what are we doing? Are we not outraged to say that, you know, for 50 years, we are just going to wait for something to happen to the little children. So that was the first thing that really upset me and was outrageous that started the 300 million challenge. That's when we said, if we have a suite, which is the story pedagogy that we have, which has made a difference for everyone, in India, if I have something, if I have, if I have a glass of water and the water is so tasty, I'll say, have this water, it's very tasty. I, I think today they've changed the water, right? it's very tasty. If I have a sweet, I will share it with you. I'm not going to eat it like this behind my thing. Now we had so many pedagogy, we had something which had worked with lakhs of children. We've touched one crore children. And we've not just touched them, we've changed their lives. Now, why would we not share this with 300 million children? So we said, okay, let us start the sharing and COVID came and we were already on this path in 2016. We had started working on turning our things into uh, E and we said, yes, we will use technology as a lever for this. And we were all with Aristotle, I think, who said, give me a lever and I'll change the world. And we said, Reading is the lever and we change the world. So people change the world and we were getting into it. And then COVID came and we went into it in a rush. Now we have a portal. We have partners across the country who are working with children. For instance, our partners are working in uh, 50 villages. They are working in 500 villages. They are working with children. They are working with tribal children. They are working all over the place. They are working with Dalit children. And these are the people who are going to be taking the portal across. And the portal, uh, I've been told by uh, Manish Ji, Manish Sisodia Ji, uh, launched the portal yesterday. He's our Deputy Prime Minister, Chief Minister, and he's our Minister for Education. And um, one of our more enlightened uh, ministers, I would say, from my little knowledge that I have of politics. I belong to the party of children. I don't know anything about politics, but I have said that. I think that, you know, he is one of the people who can take things forward. So he has said that this is not just for India. It is for the world. And this can go and reach the world. And he launched it. I think we have a very, very powerful way, which is story pedagogy. We are teaching through story. We are looking at children who are first generation school goers, whose parents have never been to school. They are some of the, you know, people who are Dalits, who are Adivasis, invisible children, invisible communities. How do you reach them? How do you give them things? 
Now we are working with all kinds of people. We are working with the radio station. We are working with, you know, people who are making videos on their own. They are making, you know, storytelling sessions on their own. I think that, you know, this is a citizen's movement, Pratish. When we as citizens are outraged and we as citizens say, we will not put up with this. Our child is important. I don't care what happens. Sorry. So, um, the challenges of making it happen, and you know, Satish uh, knows policy and execution, so naturally it's a big challenge. But I want to come back to NEP, and uh, you've been extremely diligent in going through the 850 pages and all the rest. You know, you mark man. So, from um, a founder or a startup standpoint, are there some opportunities for entrepreneurs buried inside that big? Document, what are the main things that you think uh, youngsters or people like ourselves could say, hey, this is a change that's happening. Let's come up with something for this. Okay. I think, uh, yes, it is a humongous document. And uh, the draft was 900 and odd pages. The actual policy is not that big, thankfully. I read the original and I read this. Quite a few things have been added on and left out and things like that in the policy. I'd like to talk about the policy. In the policy, you know, uh, depending on how we are looking at it, we have all the right words over there. We have the word holistic, we have the word integrated, we have the word critical thinking, we have the word creativity, we don't have the word curiosity over there. We are not building curiosity in our children. Okay, but we have creativity and we have critical thinking over there. We have vocational skills, we don't have entrepreneurship. So this is a document which is a very, very good starting point for our country. It has all the things that we are looking at that we want for our children to learn. And I'm only looking at K-12 education. Now, when you look at, and I put down these things over here in these cards to sort of remind me if I want to. But the fact is, uh, when I am looking at, you know, preschool education, which is being given so much importance, ECC is being given so much importance, and tech is being given so much importance. So the latest statement from our minister, our union minister was that we want ECC and we want a curricular framework for our ECC and we want to take for all our children. We want to have smart classrooms. Now this government's word smart we've used in cities, we've used everywhere. And I know it is a very, very uh, good word to use, but I don't know how do we become smart? How do we bring computers everywhere? And how do we get whiteboards everywhere? So the idea is that when the large picture of NEP is taken, and that's what you asked me, I think, yes, many of the things we are saying, Sata has tried and tested, and we have found success. But that has taken us 30 years from 1990 to 2020. If they want to squeeze it all into a few years, Unless they have entrepreneurs like you and entrepreneurs who are coming in and doing things, government cannot achieve it. For instance, if you take ECC, we have enormous, enormous uh, opportunity over there for anyone who started. You need a good curriculum for children. It is not a curriculum which you can borrow from America or borrow from UK or anywhere else. It has to be homegrown. It has to be one which will be suitable for 60% of our children. The money is there in the 40%. If I do an ECC curriculum and sell it to the, the more uh, elitist, richer schools, I can make my money. But if you want change, you have to come to the 60% who are not having the money. Then how are you going to be disruptive? What is that disruptive innovation that you can bring on? What is it that will be cheap? What is it that will be quick? And what is it that will impact a large number of people? If you can come in and let us talk and let us see how we can make it happen because I think the people are ready. Children are very, very ready. Please don't listen to anyone who says that children are not ready. Children are very ready. Uh, Gita, I would say that children that we have that as good as any, any in the world, it's just a system that we have educating them, we're schooling them. That lets us down. Of course, there is a, an entire environment to experience a base as well that helps us learn or not learn. But our goal is to be human beings or citizens of the world where we are as good as anyone else on the planet. In that journey, I find no matter barring the 
very, very small sliver of 0.001% at the top. Forget about that. As soon as you go to the next second percentage or below, you can't compare the skill levels from at the schooling level. Let you go to college, there is comparability. But at the schooling level, there is no comparability at all. And that's why I think this figure is 93% for India. That just doesn't get grade appropriate at any point in time. And that's a big challenge for us. So for, I see the challenge as one we discuss entrepreneurial attitude. And other one is how to become age appropriate in terms of learning. How do you help that process or how are you helping that process? Well, uh, see, these are all difficult questions, actually, Satish, because I think, you know, what happens is most of our schools, they say now about 45% schools are private and 55% schools are public or government schools. Now, even in the private school, bringing about change, the question that Tariq Ji had asked earlier, it's very difficult. We have all got used to doing things in one way, which is what the British have left behind. We don't want to change those things, okay? Now, when I look at it, I can look at, you know, three or four ways in which, when you say, how do you work in 200 or 800 slums, which is what Qatar is doing. How do you work with 800 schools? Now, that is a fairly large scale of uh, children that we have. Clustered education, I think is very good. I think bringing children together, bringing teachers together is very good. For instance, you know, uh, we called our women, our teachers who had got trained in computers, we call them cloud gurus. The cloud gurus are running a cluster of schools. They are in one school and they are the cloud guru and they are supporting a group of schools and group of school teachers to be able to access the net. Because many people are scared of accessing the net. They'll say, Pata nahi, kya karna hai, kaisa karna hai, we will not be able to do it. So you find that that is what we are doing. So one is the cluster approach. The other is the hub and spokes, of course, which we don't use in government. We've never used the hub and spokes. We are in Qatar, we are talking about the reading school chain. Pick a school, which is a reading school where children are reading well, then link them up to one school, which is doing fairly well, and then link that up to five more schools. Supposing you say that I, can, I'm in the B category and say you are in the A category and say uh, Tariq Ji is in the C category, then there will be 10 of me that you will be guiding. And there'll be 100 of uh, the, the schools which have to be coming up to that level, which I will be helping. Now, government has to give time for the teachers to help other people. Now their time is going into being present when the prime minister speaks or when some dignity is visiting the country and things like that. They come into election duties. Supposing we could take off all that from our teachers, I tell you government schools can do very well. They don't have bad teachers. When people tell me government school teachers are bad, I'll say no, they are as good or as bad as any private school. Okay, uh, just one small question before I hand over to Tariq and look at other questions. You know, sure. I find that when we use a concept, for those who create the concept, it's a lived experience. But when we, we simply mouth the word, you know, basically mouth the word, take any concept, we turn it into just words. That gap is so huge that words make us feel that we know when we don't. We begin talking about those simple things that the world is experiencing, creating. And one example I'll give you, once I was sitting with a, a, you know, at a panel, he was a CEO of a very large technology company and on my left, and he said, we don't need anyone to teach our technology. And I, I said, look, I hate to disagree with you, but that we understand technology level of using an iPhone when it's created level of imagining the iPhone. That gap from imagining, imagining the iPhone to using the iPhone, that is where I find the divide is. How would we, you know, bridge that gap in your understanding for children, for future. No, uh, Gita ji, uh, Satish loves asking what he calls simple questions that require a three hour answer. And I have about 15 questions from the participants. So I'll thank you, Satish. Seconds, and then we go to those. Okay, go on, Gita, you want to make a quick comment? Okay. Later on, Satish ji, I can come to it later on and we can have a talk on that. 
Yes. Good. Good idea. We'll do that. So, uh, we have this great participation, and I'm just going to go to the top of the Q and A, um, and you answer as short as you want, to get a, What solution do you suggest for engagement and outcome problems? How does it differ in an online setting? I think we need to uh, do many of the things that this is what Kata is doing. We are keeping the child in front. We are saying, what is it that the child wants and how will the child uh, engage with what we are presenting? A child who doesn't have anything. And we are looking at, uh, uh, we are looking at creating something, testing it out. It's now we have started testing it. I don't know whether I'm answering. I think maybe I should have the questions up on my screen, maybe. Is this well, a... let me just say the follow up there. What advice to teachers in the new normal? What would you tell teachers today? Okay. Okay, the new normal, I think has been very challenging for teachers. The way in which to go is to say that if I, if every teacher can say that, yes, I have to have some amount of what we call, uh, it's, it's, thinking about the other. I think, you know, our education has not taught us how to think about the other. And so we've never put ourselves in the shoes of a child who is now struggling with six hours of online learning. Now we all know that six hours of online learning is not going to do any difference to the child. I think she can do two hours of online learning and four hours on her own. And we follow the homeschooling pattern of learning. I think teachers will get much more benefit to their children than they are doing now. The second thing is the amount of, you know, technology which is available, connectivity which is available for our children. In our communities, we find that less than 16% children have, have connectivity. So when you don't have con connectivity, what do you do? What is the solution the teacher is going to come up with? Because that belongs to each teacher and how she comes up with it. The third is the kind of activities that I'm going to be setting as a teacher. In school, I can put it up on my blackboard. I can talk with my back to the child and I can be writing something. I cannot do that on an online course. Now, what am I going to put over there? What are the exercises? Now in Qatar, we found that when we asked our child, our children, uh, we, we have about 16,000 children we are working with now. And all our teachers are doing it across, across time and things like that. Because some parent might say, you know, I'm free at, you know, eight o'clock, I leave for work or I leave for work at 10 o'clock. We, we structure our things so that, you know, we reach the child when the child is free. And we are doing two or three things. We are putting our material onto what we call a data card. And we are giving the data card to the father who's coming there. We based it on what we call a bag of happiness. It has five story books, worksheets, crayons and pencils to write in. And this is given to each child. The happiness bag goes to the child. The child is reading. We have a little uh, data card which goes onto their computer because even in our slums, we find that the 13,000 rupee wala uh, TV has a plug, plug in for a, uh, for a uh, USB pen drive. Yes, they have a USB. So they have a pen drive. So we can put our material onto a pen drive and give it to them and they are able to plug it in and actually see it on their TV. So we are looking at what is a way in which we can increase, even on radio, we are increasing the interactivity of children because that is what is missing. Now, if we can get all the people who are listening here onto this, it will be a mess. And Mohini, I think, will die of a heart attack. If I'm not mistaken. Me, let me keep moving. Let me keep moving. I get it. I mean, you're saying you're using the new technology and integrating it. So next one, are there other collectives or groups uh, teaching in a similar way and help you scale? What are the different ways? Are there other groups or collectives organized in the same way like you doing this and helping scale up the whole thing? Yes, yes. There are groups, but I don't know how far they are scaling because when last we had a discussion with other nonprofits, we found that this is a huge challenge. Schools are facing a huge challenge of getting on because of the COVID. And technology is a huge challenge in India, in spite of all the phones that everyone has. So uh, this one is related to a couple of other points. Uh, would you not believe 
the current education system is inverted. And the other related point is, uh, you know, you mentioned nine skills. So at some point, we would like to have a list of those nine, and you don't have to read them now. The critical thinking, imagination, embracing change is an essential skill that needs to be incorporated. So basically, uh, you're turning it as upside down, right? Yes. Yes. We are going with the child and going with the knowledge of the child. And so when you go with the child, you have to turn things to say. <coughs> Right. Yes. And then that's got to be incorporated in maths, physics, chemistry, and everything, right? Maths and chemistry through story, we have found with our class 10 and class 12, even our class 8 children, story is not just something you use in preschool. It's not just for primary school children. In class 8, when I start, and I must tell you, I'm, uh, when I was in Harvard, I was uh, in UPenn, I was learning philosophy, and our professor used to walk in. And from the way the professor walked in, we knew what it was going to be. Was it going to be Plato? Was it going to be uh, uh, somebody else whom he's going to talk about? Okay, Nietzsche. So I think that, you know, the way in which we look at the learning process and how we teach the child is very, very important. So it is not whether it is preschool or whether it's high school. High school children are turned on by story and they love the story. And that's a very good entry point. Next, how can one contribute and get involved with the Kata journey? Please write to us at 300m.kata.org and we are on and we want everyone with us. <laughs> 300m.kata.org. Mohini, can you type that in please into the chat? Everybody can see it. The next one, how to help rural children using this approach. I think you've covered it a lot for learning for fun. What is uh, Sakti Gitaji referring to? Uh, Shravan Smaran? What is a Shakti Gitaji referring to? Shravana Shakti. Shravana is to be able to listen. Shravana Shakti. Okay. R-A-D-A-N. Shravana. Shravan. That's a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit word that means listen. Got it. And while I'm going to the next question, you said 300m.gata.org. Somebody says it cannot be reached. No, it can be. 300m at kata. Dot, I'm giving an email ID. Oh, it's an email address. 300m. Okay, Mohini, please update that. Yeah. Kata. Uh, you share the nine skills, so we're going to have to get that offline, and I'll share it with the group. I can tell you the nine skills. Go the ahead. With the me skills, which is curiosity, creativity, critical thinking. Then we have the me plus skills, which is confidence. Confidence gives us to be there and be regular, and that gives commitment, and commitment gives competence. Okay. So what was after commitment, what was after commitment? Competency. Competency okay. comes from commitment. You have confidence first. You have self-esteem first. Self-esteem is so important. Once a child has self-esteem, the child has confidence. And with that confidence, the child is able to involve herself in the learning. So she is committed to what she's learning. And the with more commitment she gives, the more competence she earns. So that is the three C plus, which is the me, we, we call it the me, M-E, me plus skills. And then we come to what we call the we skills. The we skills are necessary for each one of us to be a citizen. It is compassion, cooperation, and citizenship. Uh, compassion, cooperation, and? Citizenship. Citizenship, very good. Well, I, I got those, and I hope people got those, but somehow I'll put them in. I'm just racing now because... Uh, uh, you know, people are coming up with excellent points there. So during 95, 2020, uh, have been able to succeed. How many of these children have become successful entrepreneurs? Oh, when we started, 85% children were dropping out of school. Today, 85% children are in tertiary education in the Kata schools. And if you're looking at the earnings, as I said earlier, 
we have, I think, I would not be surprised, I don't have the exact figures, but I think about 40, 45% of them are entrepreneurs and the others are in work situations. They are being employed by other people. Question here is, what is the right age for children to pick up the nine skills you mentioned earlier? Is there a right age? I think if you ask me, I would say three years, four years. There is no, I mean, you just let the child be and the child will show you that she's curious and she's creative and she's a critical thinker. You don't have to do anything as a parent. You just have to be there and enjoy the child in her journey. You, you have one thing. What do you think, Gita? Don't say, always keep telling them what they should do. Let them do. That's one thing. Yes. yes. Let them so, do it and enjoy as a parent. Let's not have the stress of parents. I think parents are too stressed out these days. So, um, this one is for preschool children. Um, should we give computer to the child or teacher becomes a facilitator? Well, the teacher is always the facilitator, but it, you don't keep the child from, you see what I believe is, like I use the mind to do certain mental sums, I use a pencil, I use a paper, I use a computer. The computer is no more than a tool that we use. The earlier the child starts using that tool, the better for her. So even in our, what we call Junjunwadi, which is our uh, preschool uh, cluster education center, we have computers for the child and the teacher handles it. But when a child says that, you know, I want to say that, Mujhe kuch kaam karna hai. and I must tell you, we had a child called uh, Sonia. Sonia was a special needs child. And when she first came in and she saw the computer, she was thinking it was some, something or the other. Then she started working on it. I still have in my office, I have a tiger which with the eye so beautifully drawn and the tiger that she drew on the computer. She was a special needs child. I think at any age with any kind of special needs, children can, if given the freedom and if not being rushed, let's give them the time and give them the peace to be who they are. So it's such a constant theme, this one. So next one. <laughs> Um, toolkits, okay, so toolkits like robotics, AI, deep learning, machine learning, uh, geoinformatics uh, will make them head and shoulders above their peers if you expose the children to these things. Well, I think I would like them to be shoulder to shoulder with all the other children. Why should they be heads and shoulders above anyone else? Let us all be shoulder to shoulder and let's work for India. India is such a great country and we all need to be there for her. So, well, yes, let's... shoulder to shoulder. So, adult education and skills. Has technology transformation helped with adult education and skill improvement? Uh, has technology and skills helped and the technology transformation, the whole technology is changing. Has it helped with adult education and skill improvement? Not yet, but I think the COVID has pushed us into it and I think it will happen very soon. Right. And I think also private players coming into it, uh, uh, they're coming in for money, I think, but they will make a difference. I think we need more people who are in the social entrepreneurship sector who are able to come in and do things without expecting that, you know, uh, because there is a reason why health and education are in the social sector. We should always remember that. So a study by UNDP and Denver, Uni Denver University, 251 million people in extreme poverty and deprivation by 2030, one third of them likely to be in India. How can we ensure we are not losing a generation of children due to COVID triggered system collapse? I only think that, you know, it is in the hands of citizens. Government will, because they have systems like that. It is like you are on a highway and you missed your exit and then you have to keep going for another 10 miles, kilometers, 10 miles, I think, and then you take a U-turn and then you take another U-turn and then you come here and then you take your exit. Now, citizens are, I can catch up. You missed the thing, I can take my exit and I can go on and I can make things happen. 
I think a citizens movement and a citizens challenge is what our country needs today. We have an urgency and this is a call to action to each one of you who's listening out there. We don't have the time. We don't have the time. The government is going to come up with NEP 2020 in 2022. Now, from now to 22 years, two years, what's going to happen to this child? We'll go beyond the UNDP and the University of Denver study. We don't have time to waste. And as citizens, if we are outraged and we are compassionate and we are concerned, then today is the day we will start. And we will do it today, today. Wow, that's so important. You know, you're empowering us. What you're saying is, uh, don't wait for them. Just do it yourself, right? Yes, Tariq Ji, join us. Join I'm us. Join you. <laughs> so, uh, great conference. How do we motivate students? Yeah, tough situations. I think you've talked about this. You know, the story, a story pedagogy. Uh, please give suggestions to these two problems. Students don't have phones, computers. Students have phones are not motivated to attend classes. Yes, I think I come across both these groups. The children who don't have computers want to learn, don't have phones, want to learn, but we are not able to reach them. So we are reaching them through various means. One of the things that Kata has started is to say, if you have an extra phone with you, a smartphone, give it to a child who needs it. Now, maids are not coming home to work, but the maid has a child. And I know the maid's number. If I can give a phone, a smartphone, that child can join the education thing. Again, I would go back to citizens. I mean, India's got so much. I mean, we have such an amazing population. Now we have to put that population to some use, right? We can't just say it's a problem, it's a burden. It's not a burden. It is a plus thing that we have. Look at it as our glass is half full. And let us say that, you know, we can donate the well, smartphones for children who can't afford to have smartphones. As far as the children who have the smartphones and are not coming into it, my only solution is, please do not say six hours on the phone. Nobody can stay six hours on the smartphone. Two hours of learning and then learning on their own is more than enough. In Qatar Lab School, we asked children to make, for instance, the last time we asked them to make upma and we gave them the recipe for upma. And we, uh, the children made it and then their parents and their uh, uh, family and you know, neighbors over there had to certify it and say that this upma tasted good. And then they got their marking on it. Now, I think there's so much available within a family. Why are we not using it? Why are we saying only the teacher knows? The grandmother knows, the grandfather knows. Everyone knows. If that can happen, I think we won't have the second problem either. So next one, uh, I think you've said changes to teachers. Um, startups create apps. There will be millions of education apps. Adding more apps would be a big waste of money. What is the thing to do? Like, should you have an electrical utility that shares Kata? I, I don't know, but you know, basically the point is apps are not the answer, right? Millions of apps could waste money. I think I would go back to what you said yesterday, Tariqi. Out of 100 businesses that start, I think you said only five survive. Out of 100 apps for children, only five will survive. Children are uh, iconoclasts. They will not accept anything just for the sake of accepting it. They want the best. If they don't like it, they will tell you. Whether it's a storybook or it is an app, they will tell you they don't like it. So I think that, you know, time will say which app will survive and which will not survive. And it doesn't matter how much money has been pumped into the app or how much, uh, how much of human resource power has been pumped into it. It may not succeed. I'm saying it may not succeed. But I like the idea of, you know, if Mr. Wilcox can think in terms of, you know, uh, of an electrical utility that shares Kata and all the other best content based on teacher's guidance, Yes, I think we don't have a repository of good content. We went to government and we said, we will be able to share our content with you. But government, I think, you know, they have so much of content they are developing themselves that they may not really want content from other people. So if we want choice for our children, and that is what children living in poverty lack, they don't have choice. 
they, we cannot say that you, you, uh, NCRT is the only choice that children in poverty can have. I think they need a thousand flowers to bloom and those thousand flowers have to come from your tech entrepreneurs. They have to get themselves a very, very, very good curriculum which will tackle climate change at one end and poverty on the other and how they are linked. And we need to give it to them so that they are learning by doing and they are learning to get out of poverty. I would say that that will be the first goal for any entrepreneur who's coming in. They need to have their heart and mind in the right place. And they need to say, I want to get our children out of poverty bus. And if we can say that together, I think there is a lot of scope and a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, a lot of it starts from the heart. Very right? much so. Very much so. You know, you can do all the analysis and planning, but if you don't have that, <laughs> so, you know, and we've seen a lot of heart in uh, the conversation today, Gita G, and you transmit it and build it. So uh, we could go on a long time, but I'd like to hand over also back to uh, Satish. He knows you better even and longer time than I do. So Satish, please uh, summarize, and then we'll have to go and wrap up with Mohini. Well, I, I would hate to summarize what Gita said, because you bring the kind of energy and passion that I haven't seen in education to you. Uh, Personally speaking, I'm sure there must be some. I have no known. I think your journey for the 20 years that I've watched, Lita, is being a journey that has to, someone has to take the pieces of it, put it together for scaling up. And I know that we have talked about 300 million children, how to take it to them. But I know that we are still in tens of thousands since we haven't gone for millions. Even Sheila Dixit, the Chief Minister of Delhi, she talked about how to take your program to millions. I remember those days 10 years back. She said, we don't go back to America, remain here, do this. But I said, your system will not let us do that. You've done a great job from that point of view. Uh, I think the message of learning versus education that I get, heart versus mind that I get, uh, entrepreneurship versus uh, you know, uh, just becoming an employee that I get from you. Just, if you just take two pieces of this and incorporate that in our national policy of education, I think it will change everything. I think that's just two, three, four key parameters, entrepreneurship versus employment, learning versus education, uh, you know, my heart versus mind, you bring it, and our NEP becomes alive. And that's the message I'm, I'm sure everyone has learned a lot of things from you, but I think if you just take these three points, that is the essence of much of what we have done. And if I'm wrong, correct me. Uh, my, my, my sense is, go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely right. I, if you have a few minutes, can I, uh, can I show this little film of the Katha school? Actually, uh, Tariq, we do have another session uh, planned after this. Uh, they have a social sig uh, webinar. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Geeta. I mean, this was a really a wonderful conversation. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have a lot of comments from all of the, uh, you know, 70 plus attendees today. Uh, it's uh, such a wonderful conversation um, and dialogue uh, with you, uh, Tariq and Satish. Uh, really honored to, to have you um, and uh, support your endeavor uh, in every way. Um, uh, thank you to, to Sriram. Uh, Sriram is our co-chair from uh, Hyderabad, who's uh, been supporting this event. Uh, Satish uh, Jav, uh, also another co-chair uh, from Delhi. And Tariq Khan is in New York. I'm based in California. We are truly a, a, a global team uh, here at uh, DAI and uh, are really uh, honored to have you and support you, uh, Geeta. Um, thank you for uh, bringing awareness uh, to, uh, uh, you know, all all of the issues in education in India and uh, tackling it in such an innovative and beautiful way with uh, Katha. Uh, wish you all the best. Uh, we wanna quickly uh, touch upon um, uh, some of the, the next uh, uh, events that we're bringing to you and I'm gonna share my screen very quickly um, for benefit of everyone. I know we are way over time, um, but I would still go ahead and uh, share uh, 
Very quickly, as she ran. But, uh, Mahini, I can just mention this. So uh, in January 7th, we're skipping two weeks. We've got the end of the year. But Dr. Jakob Otani is a scientist. He's in a research lab in Zurich. And he is working. He's developed a lab to bring uh, robotics, learning robotics. And the theme is basically in the way internet came, you know, AI and robotics are going to be here affecting our lives, <laughs> a lot of our lives. So this one is going to be focusing and Sri Ram is kindly uh, going to run us through the conversation with him. And Sri Ram, do you want to tell us about Shalendra Tiparaju? Yeah, so Shalendra Tiparaju is an entrepreneur and uh, he has he's a uh, serial entrepreneur and he has uh, a company called Examity and he has gone on to other educational companies as well. So Examity is one company which has seen more than 1,000% growth in uh, COVID times. So he's going to share that what he did and how things worked right for him to grow his business more than 1,000% in the COVID season. So it's going to be an interesting session with Tariq where Tariq will ask him that how was he able to do. So hey. before we wind up, before we wind up, uh, Tariq, I just wanted to uh, just uh, put some remark. Geeta ji, it has been an immense learning from you. Uh, you, I don't know how many students you have, 300 million or more, but today you got one more, that is me. Mm -hmm. And trust me, uh, here on, uh, rather than buying an expensive mobile, I'll better donate a few more mobiles so that, you know, it can reach out to the people. Uh, amazing theory, amazing, you know, the, the heart, you've got a wonderful heart, you've done a wonderful thing, and I'm really so thankful to you, and uh, Thanks, Satish, actually, to get this started. You know, it's, it's a wonderful session. And uh, I hope Tariq and uh, I and other co-panel members would also request you to take your time again to come back and, you know, uh, guide us in the right direction. Back to you, Tariq. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Moini, we can wrap up. Moini, you're on mute. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, so uh, wonderful to have uh, Geeta uh, today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for all your engagement and interaction. It made for a wonderful uh, conversation with Geeta and uh, uh, so much insight and wisdom. Thank you for sharing, Geeta. Thank you, Satish. And uh, uh, Mohini, please share the link of the recording. People will want it. I can see the comment. Definitely. Yeah, I'll share it. That, uh, it's on uh, the Thai Global YouTube channel, and we'll be posting that today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.